Everything is being recorded. Hello, everyone. Welcome to African American Culinary Traditions, hosted by Dr. Cheryl Brissett Chapman and and her daughter Chana Brissett Shenegda. We're so happy to have so many of you here joining us. We have a wonderful panel lined up, and uh, we're going to hear some good discussion about African American. Uh, food traditions. So before we get started, I just had a couple of announcements. We are recording this so that folks can watch it later. And also, um, if you are unmuted and making some noise, please be sure to mute yourself. Um, anyway, uh, Silver Spring Town Center, as many of you know, is a small not arts nonprofit situated in the Silver Spring Civic Building, and we present well over 120 free arts and entertainment events throughout the year, including the Silver Spring Blues Festival, which is going to be on, it's always Father's Day Saturday, so it's this year, it is Saturday, June 17th, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. in downtown Silver Spring. Um, we also have another special in-person event coming up, which is inside the Civic Building on Friday, March 31st. It's another of our around the world bazaars. And so we have an international market, hands-on art activities, and two performance areas. We have steel drum music, um, a, a Bollywood wedding dance workshop, um, Bulgarian choral music, we have Latin folk uh, children's music uh, with Lilo Gonzalez, we also have um, Hawaiian music and dance, as well as a women's comedy showcase as we celebrate Women's History Month in March. Anyway, we've had a wonderful um, array of programs celebrating um, Black History Month these 28 days of February. So we packed a lot in and um, this is our final event and it's always my favorite, this one, because people just love talking about food and sharing their food memories and family traditions. So um, you are in for a treat. Um, our program is hosted by Dr. Cheryl Brissett Chapman, who is a, a founder and an, our advisory board member of Silver Spring Town Center. She was actually on the group that hired me however many years ago it was 11 years ago and um she's been a great force for us and for SSTCI as well as the greater community longtime silver spring resident and she is co-hosting with her daughter chana brissa shenegba who is um who works with rsvp K, uh, Catering, the big catering company in DC, RSVP Catering. So they will bring their expertise um, and help facilitate the discussion with other members of our panel, which include Cherie Branson, Brenda Bunting, Ray Fudge, Sharon Lee Minor, um, and also uh, Teresa Saxton, Miles Spicer. Haywood Turnipseed, who's a comic, Wanda Whiteside, and Phil Wiggins. Um, anyway, let me call our hosts to the floor to get this conversation going. Take it away, Cheryl and well, Chana. Let me bring you both up here. Great. You don't really have to spotlight me. Um, <laughs> I don't know Zoom etiquette, but I'm okay with being in the crowd because you can hear my mouth, right? Right. Well, I'm bringing your daughter too. Um, I just All can't right. find her. I can't find her now. I don't know where she went. We have yeah. so many people. Oh, there you are. She's right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she was. Oh, it jumped again. <laughs> It moves around. Um, okay, so she's. She can go uh, after me. Uh huh. I can give it to her. Okay. <laughs> after me, okay. okay? Yeah. Okay. So 
Okay, so <clears throat> all right, go ahead, Cheryl, take it away. <laughs> Is she still there? Did we lose her? Did we lose Cheryl? I don't know, something happened. I can call her if you want to um, begin, Shauna. Oh, we can just. Not the spotlight. Go ahead. You got it. You got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, then we're going to go a little backwards then while we're waiting for my mom. Um, and then she'll bring it home. We'll, we'll, we'll go rewind. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, I'm the first born granddaughter of Lily Scott, who's my grandmother, um, obviously. Um, and I. She I thought she said something. Okay. Um, so I spent a lot of time at my grandmother's house actually in Boston, who um, was originally from South Carolina. Oh, here she is. Yeah. Um, we thought we lost you. So we were gonna go no. backwards, but let's now go forward. So let's you take over. All right. I'm so sorry, I just got pushed out. But let me <laughs> but let's be real quick because I want to open this up as soon as we can. And our agenda, our agenda on the last day of Black History Month, which is controversial, but that's good. Anything controversial will stay visible. And so it's befitting that I think that our closing focus is on the traditional foods of the African descendants of American shadow slavery. I mean, I think that's like a perfect way to, to summarize it. And my first one daughter, Chana, as you've already met and she already started jumping in, has joined me to co-facilitate an exchange with all of you and this panel regarding our experiences consuming and preparing culinary dishes that served as a foundation for African-American funerals, weddings, birthdays, all celebrations, and just everyday family fair. A prominent Black pastor used to work for my agency, and he was always taking leave, and he would take leave to do burials. And I said to him, he was at 19th Street Baptist as the associate uh, or pastor. I'm saying, don't you ever marry anybody? Don't you ever dedicate anybody? Why are you always doing You do a few some people you don't even know. And you know what's going on? He said, oh, well, I just like to do fields. And I said, I said, but they got the best food. Funerals at the, the, the food at the funerals are the best food you can find in the African-American community. And he just started laughing because he was a food man. Food, food, food was his thing. So food is really big in terms of when Black folk get together. And I will begin by sharing some dishes that Big Mama prepared on a wooden stove in a tin roof shanty in rural South Carolina in the early 50s. And then China will take our family's Jim Crow journeys north and describe her favorite dishes cooked by Big Mama's firstborn, Lily Scott, my mama. So while we're doing that, and we're not going to be long-winded with it, we're just going to lay out some of these dishes, please think about your childhood and other exposures to soul food or southern dishes that are surrounded you and your family and are viewed as classical, traditional African-American dishes, and be ready to share them, um, that you these dishes you will always remember, and um, which you may hold on until now. So I'm just gonna talk about Big Mama real quickly and then China will go to her grandma and then we'll open it up. Is that okay with you all? That's what I'd like to do, just to get us kind of in it. So now let me tell you about Big Mama. Big Mama was really a tiny little black woman. She was not big, but she was the mama. And she was married to this preacher's kid, one of, I think, six boys. And the preacher was a mulatto who had got land given to him by his daddy. And he was the kindest, big, most wonderful spiritual man. And the church was named after him and founded by him in, in this rural town, this little rural community, farm community. Um, but his preacher's kid's son was not a great, was not a great guy. And this mama, big mama, they say that her father came from across the water. She she appeared to have come from pure black stock. You know, and I told some of you I'm married to a Sinhalese, so I know when I see people who come from um, Africa without a, a lot of amalgamation. And she didn't have that, but she was married to a man who looked like Frederick Douglass and who was very narcissistic. Um, she could cook anything. Um, 
Her mother-in-law, on the other hand, was born into slavery, also a little teeny petite woman, but she never refused to talk about it. Our family union still talk about how she would never utter a word about being born a slave. So I want to give you the context, because this little tiny Black woman grew everything. She didn't talk a lot. She had these anecdotes, you know? A pot can't call the kettle black, all those things when my brother and I were fighting out in the yard. Um, but she didn't talk about the book. She would grow anything, cows, chickens, turkeys, hogs. Her pet was this mean old bull that we all thought was her way of saying, don't mess with me. She canned and smoked everything. She made butter from her cow's milk. She, she made everything. She cooked on a wooden stove. White folks, go back to Raymond's thing, white folks would bring her meats and fish to cook for them because really she was cooking food that they ate too. And she was that good. They would pay her to cook certain food for them. She went back to the seventh grade after her husband died and graduated from high school in her 60s. Her son gave the land she left him to a senior citizen center named after her, Mary. So here's the, here's the dishes that I remember as a child and that came north with my family. Fried okra, corn, and tomatoes. Mm. Flat pan bread. Yeast rolls with bullet jam fillings. The, the bullets were these blackberries that were hard and didn't have no taste and no one wanted. She would take those bullets and make them jam. And then she'd put them in between the yeast bread and then she'd have this yeast bread with the jam in it. Eight thin layer yellow coconut cake. Eight layers, real thin layers, coconut cake made with the fresh butter and milk and coconut. The um, yellow six layer yellow cake with crunchy, crunchy, crunchy chocolate frosting that she made. Snap beans and butter beans. Grits and fish. Fried pork chops and fried catfish. Scrapple. Left those from the hog, because you're right, uh, Raymond. Um, Raymond was taking all of my piece that I learned from my grandmama. Um, she could cook everything but the oint from a hog and make everything taste good. Everything tastes good. Biscuits, biscuits, and biscuits. Um, she preserved everything for the winter. And since I'm north with us, when we moved north, when I was a, a, you know, a toddler, and go back south in the summer, she pickled tomatoes, corn, pickles, smoked pork, and smoked pork and fish. We had meatless meals and did not notice. Big Mama could cook everything, like I said, but the oink and make it taste good. I also discovered what fresh chicken and turkey were because she had a guillotine. So we had fresh chicken. I mean, she would cut it and then um, strip it and then cook it. I must say to you, and then I'm gonna give this to Chana. I must say to you, I did not ever feel poor. And my parents didn't feel poor until they migrated to Boston. We had land that my grandmother could get anything out of the land and feed us. And we never went hungry. And, and we also always fed whoever came to us. And those relative children that had to be raised by my Big mama, this tiny little black woman. So China, I want to give it to you. I just want to introduce those are the that's that's for me traditional African American food. It's the food that got us through uh, reconst reconstruction, got us through the discrimination, got us through being locked out of uh, of the economy. My father came out the Navy with a medallion and couldn't get a job. We had to go north so he could figure out how to feed us, except on the farm. So. It's to me food that really reflects who we are as a people. But Chana, you want to talk about you? Because then we skip me. We now got <laughs> Chana. And Chana, you want to talk about your grandmother? Yeah. So, like I was saying earlier, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother um, in her Boston in her Boston home while my mom was in school. And it was me um, and my first cousin, who is my mother's only brother his daughter, and we spent so much time with grandma. And you always, um, you know, grandma was always cooking in the kitchen. And you would think my name was, did you wash your hands? Because I was, every time I smell anything in the kitchen, I was running and sitting up in the chair. And she'd be like, did you wash your hands? Because <laughs> I was ready to eat. 
Um, and grandma, I just was in awe of how she'd have multiple pots going on the stove and how we'd all be in the kitchen. Me, granddad, my cousin, we'd come have visitors come. People would be talking. She would tell stories, but she was always in that kitchen cooking us great meals. And we just felt so loved. And um, even though my grandma was from the South, I feel like, I don't know if it was because of her nursing um, she did make some adaptations, a little healthier on the grits. She didn't do the sugar with the lots of cream. She did more of the salt and pepper with the butter, which was, I know, more of a Northern thing. But she did not skimp on the biscuits, but she did these hot homemade biscuits with molasses that I would just, that we would die for. Um, my grandmother made the best fried chicken in the world. And what's interesting is it was very simple. There was like four ingredients. You knew what the ingredients were, but you would not, you would not be able to replicate it. So I could have the same ingredients, but I just never could make that fried chicken. Um, my grandma made the best collard greens. Her green beans were not al dente. I work at a catering company. I know what your, you know, your vegetables, the texture is supposed to be. But grandma would put those green beans on the stove and cook them forever, okay? Forever <laughs> in, that, in butter and in that broth or whatever. And it was mushy and the best green beans in the world. Um, I got sick. The first time I got really sick was because she warned me, do not have more than one helping of those candy yams with the marshmallows on them. But I ate that whole pan and had the worst stomach ache. And she said that was my punishment for not listening to her, but they were so good. They was like, it was dessert. I'd rather have that than anybody else's dessert. Those candy yams are so good. Um, grandma always made the best black eyed peas, you know, with the ham hocks. The potato salad was always chunky with the eggs and the celery and the paprika and, you know, just put everything in there. Um, she made the best macaroni and cheese, but also the rice and gravy. I tell you, I mean, something simple as rice and gravy. I feel like I would put her gravy on anything. Um, and her fried chicken livers with sauteed onions. I mean, grandma got down, um, but it was just cooking all the time. And I just always had that great memory. And in her last two years of life, I was blessed to be able to live with grandma and make sure she was actually taken care of. And it was such a pleasure to be able to cook for her and give her the love that she gave me. Um, and, and also my daughter also lived um, with grandma. So just the generation of love and the back and forth is just such a beautiful tradition. Um, and we just pass it down. We keep doing it every Sunday. Um, we're lucky that all our family members live close by. Grandma and me and my daughter lived here. My mom next door, my sister five minutes away. So um, that's just the love of that culinary goodness that I think just keeps circling through and through. So, But, but you, you forgot one thing, Shauna, and then we're going to open this up. You I forgot forget. one thing. I yes. used to talk to people about how I could get over any boyfriend when I was breaking up with him. Because I would go home and eat sweet potato pie with my mama. Oh, yeah. Sweet potato pie would help me get over anything. Anything. I don't that. Eat sweet potato, and I'd be like, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. And the other thing you didn't, and, and we only have the youngest girl, is the only one that knows how to make that sweet potato pie. Because you and I right, have not. Right, my sister. Because I do not have the baking. And, and the, other, the other thing is the collard greens. Now, I got that figured out. And every male in the family wants me to make a pot of collard greens and they never leave anything for me. But well, collard greens was her thing too. Yeah. So that's, that's the story of traditional food in our family. Um, I would like to open this up and see if you all got inspired. We already heard about Cherie and her shortcut to a great um, peach cobbler. Uh, so let's open it up and see. What do you all think? What do you think about our tradition? Did we miss anything? Oh, you didn't talk about Scrapple. Scrapple was, was my, not, my, that my was your mama, thing. Big Mama made Scrapple. Yeah, not we. And, I didn't and, have that. And 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 um, um, <laughs> what do you call those? The uh, hot, the um, ham hocks. Oh yeah, that ham hocks. That, that that was that was as, as uh, we heard from Mr. Fudge. That was the whole hog. We got the whole hog. Yeah, we got the whole hog. 
but only the men that worked in the family got to eat the breast on the chicken or the or the other of the big pork chops. But you know, us chilling, we got what you know the other stuff, whatever was the second class. Um, but anyway, let's just open it up though. What do you all think? Did we miss anything in the traditional cuisine? What did you all have, or did you have some different version of it? Let's open it up. Who wants that chitlins? Yeah, I see in the chat someone drew, uh, dropped in chitlins. Oh, I love some chitlins, but no one <laughs> in my family will eat that. I will eat no, some thank chitlins. You. <laughs> oh, thank you. What you say, Brother Ray? What you say about chitlins, Brother Ray? Oh, wrinkle steak, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> That's a gourmet. That's gourmet now. True. Oh, gourmet. Yeah, um, yeah, cause see, I was I was raised in the north. Okay. And okay. We, we would travel, this is, I'm starting back in the early 1950s, we would travel south back before 95, okay. uh -huh. <laughs> we had it right around the back road, so mm -hmm. you couldn't stop anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure everybody here look about my age, and well, we, I think we all had the same thing when we traveled. We had that shoe box with the fried chicken, right? Shoe box with fried chicken. And a mason jar with iced tea in it, right? <laughs> that's, what, that's how we travel. Because this is the, it, I remember this, this was back before Tupperware. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so you, so that shoebox they do, but that but I remember go, going south, and that's when I, we really got introduced to traditional African American cuisine, as we call it, because I was raised, like I said, raised in the North right after World War II, and basically we were we were up in the land of Betty Crocker and all this other stuff, so we didn't know about that, all that good stuff down there behind the uh, cotton curtain, as we used to call it. <laughs> but when it got south, down to Grandpa, Grandpa was still running the farm down there. And me and my brother got to kill our first chicken, I think, before we was barely able to walk. Mm -hmm. Cause he used to hang them from the wire there and cut the cut their throats, let them drop down and run around. Mm -hmm. Yep. That was, yep. But that was right. and we, we had the same chicken that evening. We had to sit in the back porch and pluck it. But that was the best chicken. That was that was the best chicken we ever had. That was the best chicken though. Right? But like you said, I mean, and just it's really hard to say African American cuisine because across the range of the South, there were so many variations. Sometimes the same dish. If you came from down there in Mississippi and New Orleans, that area, there were variations down there. You came up through Georgia, South Carolina. We all basically ate the same traditional diet, but we all put our own spin on it, depending on which area of the South you were in. Mm -hmm. But like you said, this this was the food of the diaspora. This was the food of uh, right. The folks who came out of chattel slavery were after because we seem to have this image from Hollywood that you know they had the Emancipation Proclamation and suddenly everything was hunky dory, but things in many ways got worse for us because uh, uh the, the the economy in the South collapsed and so who was on the bottom to start with and we were even further down on the bottom mm -hmm. after after Reconstruction, mm -hmm. and so we had to make do with making do, essentially. But like I was just sitting here listening to your daughter talk about all that good stuff down there. I remember that, thinking that sweet taters or candy yams with the marshmallows on there. That's a that's tradition of Thanksgiving up to, to, to this day up north. You got to have the sweet taters with the, with the mashed potato with the uh, marshmallows and the uh, mac and cheese. Mm -hmm. So we basically, we took we took something that was some the macaroni and cheese was essentially somebody else's, but we made it our own. Yeah, Just put our own stamp on it. And like I said, the fried catfish, he doesn't like it. Yep, right. <laughs> Can't tap it. Because I, I try to find catfish now. Can't find no catfish around here. They, they, they want to give me some, <laughs> they want, they want to give me some fillet, say you some fillets up there, giant. I said, no, I want I want a fish with a bone in it. <laughs> it, just don't, it just don't taste the same without a bone in it. You got to go to the market. You got to go to the you market. Ask for, to that's what that. do I go down the fish market and get my catfish down there. <laughs> what, what they say, you still want the head on it. <laughs> I, still, I, I want the head on him, I want, and I want still want a bone inside of him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's not me, can, I, can I jump in for a second? Sure, yeah. I, I just want to make sure I'm. I, I, just, I was late joining. I just want to make sure I'm. I'm in there. Yeah, can, can you hear me? Can you see got me? You. Yes, I okay, can hear you, Bill. <laughs> yeah. Yes, right, oh yeah, right. I got you. I got you. Right. Miss Sherry and Miss Teresa, you guys want to chime in? I see your hands raised. Yeah. You know, I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, the traditions that we have. My my family's from West Virginia. Mm. So we've talked about the North and the South, and now, you know, I guess we're gonna hit the border states. Um, <laughs> the, um, you know, we used to do, um, I, I wanna start with, with the New Year's m m menu, right? Yeah, because yeah. that was the picture 
and I, it was it was mine. That was our our New Year's Day food, and um, you know it was um, you 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 had to have certain things to ensure a good a good year. You know, you 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 had to have pork because that was for prosperity. You know, right. you, you had to have either greens or cabbage mm -hmm. because that was for dollar bills. Mm -hmm. You know, you 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 had to have either um, black eyed peas or pinto beans because that was for the coins. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it was the the meal itself. You know, and the and the you know the cornbread was you know for like the sweet things in life, right? I mean, so so the meal itself, you mm -hmm. know, had had a meaning. It 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 had a, a purpose. Um, I I cannot um, ever remember not eating that on New Year's Day. You know, when I got married, I started making that, and um, you know, I told my husband, you know. Jesus help me. I, I hate black eyed peas. I really do. <laughs> but, but I'm afraid not to eat them. I don't know what happens if I don't eat them. <laughs> it's like something could befall me just because I didn't have these black eyed peas. You don't, and like, so, you know, I, you don't like hopping jar. <laughs> well, you know, West Virginia um, is really not a very rice centric place. You know, where the part of West Virginia I'm from is heavily influenced by the Germans, right? Mm -hmm. And so we eat a whole lot of cabbage and a whole lot of potatoes, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and we've sort of made that our own, you know, like fried mm -hmm. potatoes and onions, which I think has a fancy name, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> what what part of uh, West Virginia? Um, my, my family is from uh, Jefferson County, so right on the other side of Harpers Ferry. So, oh, okay. Um, okay, you're in the panhandle. So we, we've been, we in the panhandle. You know, I tell people that, you know, John Brown came and if we knew he, we, he was there, we, we probably would have joined up with him, but <laughs> we didn't know. Uh, <laughs> the, um, um, you know, that, that was, you know, one of the, the traditions. The other one is, you know, we, we always had fried chicken on Sunday. Every Sunday, I cannot remember a Sunday growing up when we didn't have fried chicken. We didn't didn't have it for the rest of the week, you know. And 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 like everybody else's people here, you know, my my grandparents had um, had a small plot of land, but they grew everything on it, you know. And so, you know, there were we, we had a lot of meatless meals, you know, and or or, or at least meals that you, it was only like a very small piece of meat you know but mm -hmm. it was okay because you you just didn't you, you didn't you didn't know what you were missing you know it wasn't a big deal meat really wasn't a big deal um my grandmother used to always have you know i guess because of the german influence we didn't do mardi gras but we sure did shrove tuesday you know mm -hmm. and so on shrove tuesday you'd have pancakes you know I, I really hated Shrove Tuesday. I did not like eating pancakes at night. I thought it was something bizarre about it, but we had it every year, you know? It was the way you kicked off Lent, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We had, um, there would always be nuts and oranges and hard candy at Christmas, um, along with the, you know, the cookies and stuff. Um, and and my grandmother would make um, souse, which I think they fancily call head cheese now. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that, you know, souse is like um, it, it's in line with eating everything except the oink. But it's yeah. a jelly. It's a, like a in a yeah. jelly. Scrapple. Um, no, scrapple is different. Scrapple is like mm -hmm. a fried thing. Souse is 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 like a jelly. Okay. You know, yeah. um, you eat it. You eat it on crackers. You know, mm -hmm. um, the um, the other thing I know, I remember we always had, and I just can't remember if it was in the spring or in the fall. It might have been both. Was cracklings? You know, mm. somebody would, you know, slaughter a, a hog, and um, and the people would put in their orders for the cracklings. 
you know, and so, you know, they would mysteriously show up, you know, after, <laughs> after the hog had been slaughtered, you get this big old, this big old, uh, uh, thing of cracklings. Um, now, Miss Sherry, go ahead and, and explain what cracklings are for, then, for the folks who don't know. What, what are cracklings? Cracklings are, um, imagine, uh, pork rinds. Fried right. pork, pork rinds. rinds. Yeah. Except yeah. The, the cracklings are smaller mm -hmm. and more crispy. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And they're like, um, they kind of look like fried clams almost. You, you know, they're, they're in a bag, right? Like, uh, they, like potato chips? No, not, not potatoes, but they're they're like thin, long, you know, and they, they look like fried clams. Mm -hmm. uh, but they taste like pork rinds, but better. Um, <laughs> yep. And then the, the one thing I really need to mention is, uh, Cheryl brought up the funerals, you know, and um we used to make my grandmother used to make what was called funeral pie. If you don't know what funeral mm. pie is, let me tell you what funeral pie is. <laughs> funeral pie is um it was called that because it would always be at a funeral. Somebody would always bring it to the repast for the funeral. And and what it was is raisin pie. Funeral pie is raisin pie. And if you've never had raisin pie, it might be hard to imagine that this would be something really good. But raisin pie is just absolutely magnificent. It is, um, you know, thick and and um, sir, sweet. Sir, I don't want to interrupt you, but let me just tell you, in my world, it was the almighty pound cake. Mm. Who could make the best pound cake? Mm -hmm. They had to bring it to repast. And let me tell you, when my, when my, I, will, I guess it was when my father died, maybe it was when my mother died. I've had a lot of death lately. It was when my, my mother, my father died. And the woman from the church that makes the best pound cake, I mean, our big one, the best to just melt in your mouth. She brought it to the house. And I had my cousins and all these people from down so that come up and they came over to the house. And we had all the stuff that people sent over from, you know, Whole Foods and Safeway into those cakes, right? That pound cake was that. Mm -hmm. My cousin was trying to take half the pound cake. I really told her off. I said, "You need to get your hand off that pound cake. <laughs> That's for the immediate greed, and you are not immediate greed. <laughs> take one of them store bought pound cakes home with you. Not that because it was. It's, it, it really comforts you. It's so good. It but is. I think that I think that I think that people look for that pound cake too. I don't know about the, the, the raisin pie, but they look for that pound cake. But I don't know if other folk have that experience. Well, let me ask a question real quick, because you, you jumped on something. We're going to get back to you, Ms. Sherry, and come to you, Ms. Teresa right. and Stacey. But the question that I have when you just jumped in that show, when you talked about the comfort. Because when yeah. you went to pound cake, I immediately went to my grandmother, immediately went to that red line of food coloring that goes through it. That it, that That's real what real pound cake has to me. So it's that comfort when you smell it. When you when you when you hear it cooking, when people coming around the kitchen, what is it about that comfort that the traditions of our people have looked at food as that way of just reminders of who we are? So, what is it a way? Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, I think for for me, what I've seen is that the 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 church was important. Mm -hmm. So there was this whole notion that hope was in the by and by. But in the immediacy, you need to have food mm. and your family, mm -hmm. right? And your family and food was really the foundation of being alive because all the other stuff's going to be messed up. Mm. And you're not going to find the glory till you die. But that, that, that was a Southern kind of orientation. So there was a small, my grandfather, um, great-grandfather, founded a little church. It's still down there, Piney, Piney Wood Baptist Church. What I'm saying, there's a bunch of them, but this is where you would go often families and the neighbors of, that would walk and drive. Um, this is where you would go to find comfort in Jesus mm. and then comfort in the food. And that's how you were anchored to get through a pretty, pretty hard rock life. Mm -hmm. And frankly speaking, now when you look at our inner cities and the kind of Problems we're having as a community, black community, because the black community isn't thriving, the families are not, the kids are going to be off the chain. And you look at it, it's both having that sense of family being housed, 
All right. You know, we had the big brass beds. I don't know. It seems to me, Mr. Fudge, you and my generation, we had yeah. the big brass beds and the pots underneath the bed in the south. And so you were sleeping with your cousins, all their feet all over you, whatever. Yeah, you didn't know who pot. showed up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, know, you, 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 you had maybe three or four room house. And you all were all in there, and the boundaries were such that you lived in there and respected each other, but you had a house, you had food, yeah. and you had Jesus. Amen. That's how you got through all of the stuff. And Amen. there was stuff, you know, we, we know what the stuff is. It's Black History Month. Yeah. Stuff. <laughs> and it's still going on, but we need to figure out how to recreate. When they say the village, well, it's not really the village. It's around how does the Black family protect itself, feed itself, Mm -hmm. And have and have hope, and have hope. Mm -hmm. So the pound cake to me, the pound cake to me is if we can get this big old sweet wonderful pound cake up in here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that no, Miss Teresa, what did you have? You had this a little while ago. I'm gonna come to you, brother Phil. Miss Teresa, what's oh, that? No, uh, you all have pretty much covered uh, most of what, <laughs> most of everything that I kind of remember, but. Um, I was just going to say when, um, uh, you know, when she was talking about the uh, Black Eyed Peas, uh, that was a, and still is for a lot of people in New Year's Day tradition. Uh, and we used to, my mom used to cook those with um, pig ears. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was something that you had to at least have a taste of. Everybody had a taste. I don't like Black Eyed Peas now. And I don't eat, <laughs> I'm not a pea or, or bean eater. Um, as, as I like green beans, but, um, you know, not, not, uh, regular beans. In fact, my husband, uh, didn't believe that, uh, I'd never had pinto beans. Um, but I said, I don't think we ever had those. And he asked my mom and she said, no, we, uh, she never cooked those. So I don't, to this day, I don't know what they taste like. But he grew up in Southwest Virginia, mm -hmm. and that was a staple for them. But she evidently didn't like them, so she didn't feed them to us. But um, the traditional foods of holiday foods are what I remember that you all were talking about. I always had turkey for huge turkey for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, I always had um, uh, fried chicken every Sunday for dinner, and only on Sunday. Um, and when Easter came, uh, I, I don't know whether my mom, we didn't, couldn't afford a ham or what, but she always cooked a smoked shoulder mm. and that tasted, uh, I thought it was ham, mm. uh, you know, and, and, uh, and, but it was a smoked shoulder. I don't even know if they have those in the stores anymore. Do they? Have does anybody um, know there are smoke shoulders around? Bal Balducci's, Balducci's, your yeah, Balducci's, yes. yeah, Balducci's, has, and I like that pork shoulder better than the ham. Mm. I like the smoke shoulder after I found out it better. was ham, I liked it better than the ham. But I'm not a cook, my mom was a cook, and uh, my sister and I didn't in, really inherit her uh kitchen talents. Um, I always my friends laugh at me because I always say there are two types of people in the kitchen, those who can cook and those who <laughs> fix food. And I'm, one people, I'm one of the people who fixes food. Teresa, are you telling me you've never eaten a lima bean, lima beans? You I have eaten, eaten them, but I don't like lima beans. And you don't like green peas? With peas with I them? don't like green peas. They taste like little cotton balls. So <laughs> I stay away from beans, peas, and beans. I do like snow peas in, in oriental dishes okay. and okay. green beans. In fact, I had green, um, steamed green beans, whole <laughs> petite green beans for dinner tonight. But other than that, I don't care for beans as a as a meal and peas. Yeah. I um, brought your sister on here, Teresa. Uh, not even and baked beans. <laughs> because she was able to make it sooner than she expected. Is this some true? Does that resonate with you too, Pat? She's she's right. There's some people who cook. 
<laughs> oh, <that's your> <laughs> Tell when, our mother, when our mother passed away, what um the, the, the any skills that we had were, were all gone as a family. But when she fell into my hands for care, I I she she was such a healthy cook and such a great cook. I felt so sorry for her, but I did the best I could. <laughs> That, but but um, um, you know, one of the things, uh, someone, I think it was Cherry talking about raisin pie or something like that. It brought back to memory that my father, only at Christmas time could you get it. It was a raisin pie, but it wasn't called raisin pie. It was called something else. Minced meat. Minced meat. Minced meat. Minced meat. Minced meat. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And yeah. you could only get yeah. it. Uh, you know, at least we could only, he could only get it. I, I never tasted it because I didn't like the way it looked. But he could <laughs> only he could only get it at Christmas, Christmas time. But um, you know, mother always made home. If she made rolls no other time of the year, she made mm. them for Christmas dinner rolls. Fresh baked rolls. Fresh baked rolls. So, you know, Christmas in the African American uh community was a time to eat. Mm -hmm. and a time for worship. Mm -hmm. so, and, you know, uh, we, we did talk about the crossover and some people in the chat have put in crossover. Um, I know I had a good friend in Appalachia. He ran a nonprofit and he and I talked about his challenges there. Um, and when we started talking about what he liked to eat, I said, that's what we eat. And the difference between what he was eating and what Black folk were eating was the same food. So my question to you is, is um is fruit cake a crossover as <laughs> fruit yeah. cake as black folk? Because I like my daughter hates. I love some fruit cake, and I see that at a lot of our holidays. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is that a crossover fruit cake? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my mom makes fruit cake. This is my hand fruit cake. My mom makes fruit cake for the holidays. This is my mom, Barbara, who's Italian American. Oh. She makes <laughs> a lot of fruit cake. <clears throat> well, I make a fruit cake, but it's not the real old fashioned one that they used to make in in days gone by, like my grandmother's make. I make it with bread mix, like a, mm -hmm. a date nut or cranberry. And I put a jar of minced meat in it and the dried fruit. And mm. Eggs. It's really good. It really that sounds is. delicious. People, people love it or hate it. That's great. Okay. Mm. You, there's yeah. no in between. I mm. think it gets right. a rap, bad rap. <laughs> yeah, good fruit cake has gotten a bad rap. <laughs> uh, fruit cake is one of those things. It's it's it, it either you like it or you don't. As mm -hmm. my opinion yeah. is that those the folks who don't like it haven't put enough rum on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> There you go, brother Miles. <laughs> but I don't, I don't drink. Um, and and I'm wondering, we have gone since seven o'clock, and nobody's yeah. mentioned cornbread. Right. Well, somebody uh, said flatbread. Uh, Cheryl, said. Cheryl said it earlier. Yeah, Cheryl. Said. Yes, there we go. We got one. I, and I know a woman. Stacy's here too. So. And um, she makes cornbread in a cast iron skillet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Then that's the question about woman, that cast iron skillet, brother. What, this woman makes cornbread in a cast iron skillet, and I had to marry her. I ain't kidding. Tell the truth, shame the devil. Tell the truth, well, and shame well, the devil. You can wake up <laughs> and hear her rattling pots and pans in the kitchen, and then the smell of the cornbread or the biscuits comes up yes. to you. Mm. It's all over, huh? Mm. Now, do you put, she put, she put corn in her corn, corn in it, right? Or did she, she put cream corn? She has uh, experimented with her cornbread over time. She used to put a can of cream corn in it. Right, right. And she used to um, grate up some zucchini in it. Mm. Oh. But right now we just get the the hardcore cornbread these days. I am not complaining one time a little bit. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So sweet or not sweet? Not, not sweet. sweet. No, no. Not uh, sweet. What is it? It's, 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 
and you know, sweet corn bread is really cake and a jalapeno. jalapeno. Yeah. That's good. The jalapeno corn yeah. bread. That's good with, with some good chili. Corn. With some chili. Yes, indeed. Hey, Miss Stacy, think... you had your hand raised for a while. Miss Stacy, what you got? Yeah, oh, I, was just, I was just listening to no. y'all. <laughs> um, so I make uh, a I... cornbread casserole and I have the cornbread mix and I put corn, cream corn, jalapenos, cheese, onions, mm. and bacon. Oh. And that is delicious. Wow. It's just wow. delicious. That bacon. Wow. wow. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking we have, about. We have Stacy Brooks, who you may know from our Blues Festival. Stacy oh, was yeah. on our last panel for uh, European culinary traditions, uh, talking about her German heritage. It, and, and she's also has African American heritage, but was a uh, daughter of military man who was stationed in Germany and lived there many years. Hey, Stacy, good to see you. So I, I was just going to add that um, when I came here to Maryland for the summertime and I came here for good, um, my grandfather, they had a farm mm. and we, my grandmother used to um, can peaches. We would go, mm -hmm. and we would go get peaches and we would be all fuzzy wuzzy with the peaches because we would be picking them and eating them. And my grandmother was like, Stop, <laughs> you know, and then we would yeah. also pick apples and we yep. would make applesauce with yep. that thing oh, yeah. like mm. that and yep. we would, um i don't like nutmeg so she would allow me to make my own applesauce with just cinnamon and sugar mm. and, uh, because mm. i don't like i don't like nutmeg mm -hmm. but um hearing about the hog every thanksgiving my grandfather would have some of the neighbors come and help him and they would kill like three or four pigs and he had a smokehouse right. and he, would, he mm. would let people you know people that helped him with it he would give him a shoulder. So when you said a shoulder, I remember my grandfather making this brown sugar, sage <laughs> type of rub thing and uh, um, hanging them up in the smokehouse. And, and it would just be there curing and all these mm -hmm. pieces of meat in there. And then my grandmother would take a bunch of meat and she would send it off to be ground. And then she'd come back and she had a container of sage like this. And she'd do all that. And then my grandfather had the casings and we would make the sausages. And we used to, I'm the oldest of the oldest as well. So we used to um, have a competition. Who can make the most sausages? Mm. You know? And it wasn't like we was going to win anything, but <laughs> we wanted to see who could turn the most sausages without getting tired. So I remember doing that. And my aunt Zora, mm. my grandfather's sister, used to be the one cleaning the chitlins in the in the basement. Oh, I love so she would have a wood stove. She'd be watching the Redskins on TV. <laughs> and then she'd be drinking her little nip. We called it a nip. <laughs> nip. <laughs> give, me, give me some of that nip. So she'd have the nip. And uh, I wasn't supposed to be down there, but they would put the, after they would shoot the hogs, it, it was on a hook like this. Mm -hmm. And they would hook the um, the hooves on these on these nails. And then they would split the pig and it would all the guts and stuff would be in the bucket. Right. And then my <laughs> uncle would take the bucket. I'm behind the tree now. I'm not supposed to be down there, right? But I'm seeing all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and my uncle would take that to my aunt Zora and she would separate everything and make everything. And it was just, it was fascinating. It was weird, but it was fascinating to me <laughs> because when I lived in Germany, I lived on the 16th floor in a high rise. So <laughs> it was like... I uh, I saw we were able to see um, what was that movie on on the prairie was the prairie um, Little House on the Prairie Little House on the Prairie Little, Little, House, House, on the Little prairie. House on the Prairie So when I used to come visit here, I thought that's what I was like. Ooh, we're living like living house on the on a, on the prairie. I'm in the country, and I didn't know. I used to say the crunchy because I didn't know no better. But my grandmother would take that crackling. She would make the crackling, and she would also put it in the cornbread. Mm -hmm. She would also put it in the mm. corn. yeah crackling cornbread yeah yeah she would put the crackling in the cornbread and I just thought that was uh, those were the best years of my life even though I grew up in Germany coming back to the mm -hmm. states in the summertime and seeing my grandma do that and she made lima beans but the only way I could eat them me she put the um dumplings in it I would eat all the dumplings Ooh. I would eat oh. all the dumplings out yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
What you explained, Miss Stacy, was rooted to the tutor. From the rooter to the, the tutor. Rooter to the, and in Germany, the whole hall. Germany the same way. In <laughs> yeah. Germany, yep. they eat everything from the rooter to the tutor. On the table in Germany, you would have a hand on the table mm -hmm. of a pig. Mm. I've mm. eaten pig ear, I've eaten tripe, I've eaten mm. snout. Um, and of course, my uh, grand, my American grandmother used to send pickled pig feet to us in Germany because mm. we couldn't get the kind that they had over here because it wasn't in the PX at the time. Now you could probably get it, but back then uh, we, they would send crackling. My, my grandfather used to send um, Cairo syrup and molasses over to Germany because we couldn't get it over there. But my grandma made uh, molasses cookies and all that stuff. So y'all make me hungry talking about Really? <laughs> well, I have to tell I have to chime in and tell you, I made my lima beans and rice tonight. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's what my grandma Go ahead, would always make <laughs> for any, anything that was a happy occasion, a sad occasion. If grandma was making lima beans and rice we knew we were gonna have our comfort food and our wow. warm night and enjoyment oh. for the evening so i went and got me some lima beans and my onions and i i use turkey neck bones now you know mm -hmm. no don't use the, the pork yeah. neck bones anymore and i after this afternoon i cooked everything down to a nice mm, a nice savory stew and <laughs> Put the beans in and let them cook slow and on a low boil till it's it's a gravy. It cooks to a gravy and oh, yeah. got my rice and it's gone now because I was I knew <laughs> I would be hungry listening to y'all. So mm, I yeah. ate me a nice little bowl of lima beans and rice. But I'm gonna go ahead and add this in here. Maybe y'all uh remember this. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah, yes, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Bill Withers, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Can you hear it? Yeah. Church on Sunday morning. Yeah. yeah. Leave that boy alone. Right. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask Sheree a question. Sheree, yes, the day in West the day in West Virginia do barbecue, I was thinking about Stacy. Stacy, by the way, is back at ein Deutsch Ambition uh, in Fiyara in Unguskula. Uh, so, you know, yeah, we got some black folk over here that have never been to Germany, but they think they understand something over there. I'm glad to know you're <laughs> over here, right? But I want to ask um, Cherie, because, you know, I'm married to a Muslim, and so Eid, so, uh, you know, I was there in July, and they were hanging sheep all over the place, and slicing them up and opening them up. I had to kill the sheep. So th they do to the lamb what we do to the hog over here in, in the past, right? Um, but what I did, I had, I, had, I had brought over a Costco big grill to put on our patio. And they went to like, what are you? I said, let's barbecue the lamb. They were like, barbecue the lamb? I said, uh-huh, let's do that. Uh, so I want to ask Cherie, in West Virginia, did they do barbecue? What's this barbecue? Is that part of our tradition? I know places like Texas, which has been predominantly black forever. It's, it's, West Virginia is not predominantly black, but do they do barbecue? Is that a tradition of our people barbecue? The mustard barbecue, the honey barbecue, the hot barbecue. Is that part of our traditional food? Because no one's mentioned barbecues. You know, barbecue we, we cooked out, okay? Um, so, you know, there were in the summertime, I wouldn't say that it was, it wasn't a big deal. You know, it really wasn't a big deal. Um, it, you know, it was a 4th of July kind of thing where you would, you know, put some stuff on a grill. So no, I don't really, um, we, it was not, it was not a thing. It was just not a thing. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you, Cherie, uh, being from West Virginia, do, do you have full uh, ramps? Yes. Mm. I love ramps. Do yeah, <laughs> ramps. Ramps. y'all know what ramps are? No. Yeah, and, 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 okay. and, and while I'm talking, I'll ask two questions and then I'll turn it loose. Uh, my sister converted to Islam quite a while ago. And I've been trying to come up with alternatives to, you know, for the smoky, you know, pork that we use, you know, ham hocks and that. And of course, this is a turkey and all. Um, 
I've, I've been using like smoked onions. You take, you know, thick oh. slice some onions and throw them on the grill, smoke them real slow. And also smoked and pickled onions. Oh. And if you, you know, cut that up in your greens or in your beans, and, it, and you'd swear there was a ham hock in there. Uh, you can use oh. smoked paprika too. So, yeah. But anyway, tell me about the ramps. So ramps for, for people who may not be familiar, ramps are, um, okay, so they grow wild. It's a little green thing. It's like, um, I'm trying to think of how to describe it. Ramps come in the spring. Yeah. Um, and you can only get them in the spring and they yeah. grow wild. It looks, it looks a little bit like a scallion, except it that looks the, like a scallion, this but it has thing a, coming up is like a wide a uh, leaf instead of a skinny. And the, the flavor, it, it's almost like a, um, uh, <laughs> it almost looks like a lily of the valley, you know, the, the, the leaf, yeah. you know, um, yeah. but, but the flavor is between, is a mix of onion and garlic yeah, I, would say, um, yeah. I, I think they're i i think they're part of i don't know if they're part of the wild garlic family or the wild onion family but yeah, yeah. Look it up. they're wild are, leeks wild yeah, yeah leeks. they're leeks they are yeah. they are a huge thing ramps uh and uh pawpaw you know we we also have pawpaw in west virginia if you've never had pawpaw it um it grows on a tree <laughs> and um <laughs> yeah the you know, it's um, is it's a it fruit. A vegetable? Oh, it's a no, fruit. It's a 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 fruit. On, a, on a tree, and the the best way I can describe the taste to you is like um, imagine mango, but sherbety. Mm. Oh. Almost tastes like mango sherbet. Oh. Um, and I've been trying for mm. uh, a little while to actually get some pawpaw trees, but uh, because they grow wild in West Virginia, they just like you know they just grow wild. So, so does marijuana, actually, but but you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of weird stuff that just grows wild and and it's and the ginger, mountains, you know, the grows wild in West Virginia. I yeah. mean, you know, but I probably should be, people now yeah. will want to move to West Virginia. But mm. um, but but yeah, okay. So, but um, uh, actually, um, um, growing pawpaw. I mean, you you can get a pawpaw tree and put in your backyard. You have to probably get like three or three or four so that they can mm -hmm. cross pollinate um yeah. and I, that's what you know i've been trying to do that for the past couple of years but they're really hard to find um but anyway yeah those are those are our our, our west virginia native delicacies i don't i'm not sure oh uh, look at that mm -hmm. they, yeah. they are where those things are they, they just they just mm -hmm. grow wild yeah mm. yeah all right, we got two raised hands. We got Miss Sharon and then we got Brother Raymond. Well, let the record show. I brought the peach cobbler. Oh. Oh. Hey, 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 hey. I'm just wanting to put it out there that I did. Oh. I cooked and and um I mean, I don't know about you all, but I'm hungry. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I want all of them. The lima beans, mother. I know where you live. <laughs> yeah, I need your address, um, sure. You know, I'm actually a fourth generation Washingtonian. So my experiences about being in the South wasn't physical because my I grew up, my, my great grandmother lived to be 96. And we had peach, we had peach tree in our yard. Um, I grew up in a community, Eastland Gardens, which is still very, very, uh, very much a, a black community. And uh, we, everybody had fruit trees, so you had fruit. And it was just a really, really wonderful place to, to grow up. And then, um, I, everything that you've mentioned, we had it. And uh, even on New Year's Day, uh, my great grandmother would actually have a hog's head. I never ate it, but I mean, she, but I watched her create, I mean, make work this thing and knock the teeth out. And I mean, it was really, <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm an artist, uh, which, 
even when I uh, when I'm making my 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 art, uh, one of my best areas in my home is uh, in my kitchen because cooking and making art are fluid with me. I mean, I can do one and I do the other, and I love cooking. I don't know how I how I learned. My grandmother uh, was the best cake maker, and my great grandmother made hot rolls. And um, oh. we always had family and friends, and so it's really great to hear everyone talk about about their 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 uh, experiences. And I, as I was listening, I was thinking of my father uh, because we are talking about African American cuisine, but you really can't separate Africa from a lot of our cuisine. And uh, so it's real, and I'm an anthropologist too. So this is like, I'm listening here, absorbing everybody more so than participating, contributing. But um, when you were talking about black eyed peas, which I have in my freezer now, um, uh, when you go to Ghana, my second home is Ghana. That's where okay. I, I hail for, I claim uh, I have an adopted family. They adopted me there. And uh, so my uh, mother, uh, my adopted mom would make uh, wachi. And wachi reminded me of Hoppin' John. So lots of times we would talk about how we, you know, I would, I, they didn't believe it. I was like, oh, this is like Hoppin' John. They were like, what's Hoppin' John? So it was a real great exchange mm -hmm. of how these things carried over, uh, over the waters, over the pond, as some people say. And yeah. then with the peaches, uh, I, and this is just the last thing, but with the peaches, I was fortunate to work with a, a group that was in, when I was living in Ohio, uh, they wanted to take these 23 black guys, black young men to uh, travel to New York City and into uh, Washington DC. And they asked me to be their field instructor, field work instructor. And uh, so, I said, well, you can't go to New York and not go to Harlem. And mm -hmm. they were like, okay. And I said, you can't go to Harlem and not go to Abyssinian Baptist Church. <laughs> so, you know, we ended up going to Abyssinian. And mm -hmm. so I, the peach cobbler that I, and my, grand, my great grandmother, my grandmother could make peach cobbler, but my peach cobbler comes out of this wonderful book. Let me see, okay. Uh, from Abyssinian, you know, Abyssinian Church um, is the home of uh, the uh, Adam Clayton Powell mm -hmm. and his father, and now the late Calvin Butts. Okay, you know, he has transitioned. But there is a little store, there's a recipe in here that I have been using for years, and it's so simple. It's called Magic Cobbler. And so that's what I did. And, and, and when I presented it to the deacons at our church when we were in Ohio, uh, they said that it was impossible that I could make this, this, uh, this kind of cobbler because I wasn't old enough. And I thought that that was the best compliment. I mean, when you can get a deacon board Mm. to say that. And so I, I, I wrote back, I, as a matter of fact, I go visit Abyssinian um uh online and i told them that i was going to talk about their uh miss what's her name miss um uh, miss sarah perry i want to put her name out there because she made that she made me look good and <laughs> and i just thank god that uh you know we as a people um we carry it on and we carry mm -hmm. it back and we bring it forth. Mm -hmm. I, West Virginia, I understand West Virginia and all the foods that you've been bringing up. Never been in the South as such, although some of my folks migrated from Florida and from the Bahamas. That's why I say you can't separate African American cuisine from 
the history. And I'm so glad that that uh, Cheryl really American. brought that up. That mm -hmm. you know, you it, it is much deeper uh, mm -hmm. spiritually, family, mm -hmm. uh, uh, historically, and comfort. Well, you brought up comfort. The comfort comes from the internal, the spiritual that right. we have been able to hold on to. So mm -hmm. I don't want to start preaching because I could do that too. But <laughs> I really, I mean, it really is important for us to recognize how valuable this, this exchange, this, this, this kind of uh, talking about who we are in a beautiful mm -hmm. way and how our tables were beautiful and kwanzaa continues it going on mm -hmm. so you know i just want to throw that out and then i'll as one guy said i'll staple my lips <laughs> no don't staple let them fly we're talking about it we're wonderful. talking about it <laughs> that was wonderful that was yeah. wonderful yeah. in the chat um my son-in-law is giving his his very brilliant always perspective about how much the food is the same and he's agreeing with you but there are different mm -hmm. cultural interpretations of how we play that like the corn base the couscous the rice base but i'm laughing because you know i have one ear into trying to keep my mouth stable when my husband is talking about the fight over what, who who created jalo and is jalo <laughs> really a thing or is it just a thing and so I'll be leaving my, shut my mouth because, you know, I got to do that once in a while. But well, I'm intrigued. Fufu, fufu is how, coming up. There's a Fufu month. There's a Fufu celebration right. coming up in August. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like sometimes you just step back and let. You just step back. Let, but, but, step but, back. But, but, but I think that people assign, you know, um, Xavier talks about palm oil being the essential difference in the diaspora, whether you use it or not. But sometimes we assign things to the food is a symbolic claiming of that comfort, right? This is this is my thing. This is my people's thing. And it may not be essentially different thing, but it has its own symbolic meaning. And symbolism is important because it's meaningful. Even if it's not factually anything different, it's symbolically distinctive. And I think that that's what we have to get into valuing each other's diversity within the diaspora and valuing the fact that we all come at this symbolically and spiritually in a different way. And it's meaningful, even if the fact of the matter, couscous is couscous here, there, and everywhere. <laughs> Brother Raymond, you have something? Oh yeah, I'm just gonna to touch on the point. Somebody had kind of from an angle had mentioned barbecue. And I can't think of any way to get an argument started than mention barbecue anywhere. Because every, every, everybody tries to claim as his kin, but nobody really can track their origins. It just happened to something that's popped up in multiple cultures, with even within the United States. If you go to one spot, if you go to Texas, they got their own stamp on barbecue. You go to Kansas City, they want to fight you. You go to Memphis, they want to argue about that. So basically, we've taken barbecue and said, hey, this is South Carolina to... too. South Carolina. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. We got yeah. our mustard right. barbecue. That's right. That's right. South, South Carolina. Lady, that's right. Yeah, because we're going to say this. South Carolina. We got the best barbecue. <laughs> oh yeah. See, like I said, you can <laughs> get, get a, you can get an argument going good with a hold on, on, brother, barbecue. Right. Hold on one second. Yeah. Michelle said, "Don't lay claim," and then she laid claim to South Carolina. <laughs> oh yeah, that's it. There you go. <laughs> that, that's it. That's it. That's it. But, but you it's got all folks from Texas to claim it. Folks from North Carolina to claim it. Actually, Mexico too. They, yeah, they, 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 buddy. Yeah, yeah, buddy. Now we've been talking about this food, right? We've been talking about food, and I, I noticed in the chat because I want to jump on this real quick. Um, I grew up in Gary, Indiana, so I grew up Muslim and also in a Rastafarian household. So wow. there wasn't a lot of swine, swine in our household. Although my great grandmother, <laughs> who was Seven Day Adventist, would cook chitlins and pork uh, for my great great grandfather because that's what he wanted. So I did notice that even if she didn't eat it, she made sure her man had something to eat <laughs> that he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> I said it to say. Um, so now we have uh, veganism. Well, it's not now because it's been it's been a thing in our communities for some time eating uh, uh, vegetables and eating what ital food or vital food. Um, so let me ask you guys about that. What are your thoughts about today and modern day uh, uh, appliances of 
salads, fruits, and those type of foods and natural foods in addition to our traditions. Because our traditions, people don't, and I want to jump, say this real quick, the salt that goes in our food, which led to our diabetes and <laughs> high blood pressure, was actually something that was necessary in order to preserve the food for yes. as long as it was because we didn't get it that often. Mm -hmm. So when you look at it from that aspect, and also when you look at some of the things that happened to us culturally, like um, here in Af African Americans here, Black folks in the, in the States talk about watermelon. Although watermelon was one of those things that we could grow easily and was one of those things that we equated to economy when we first released us, when we were first released from being enslaved. That was something that we could do, that we could grow, and that was self-sustaining, that we didn't have to rely on anyone else. So you look at a lot of Black colleges, you look at a lot of A&Ts, agricultural technology. Working the earth was one of our things. Eating food, using these methods was one of our things. So let me ask you now about what we look at this as we see these shifts and as we see these as we see society go to a way of preserving itself and learning how to sustain itself i'm mindful of also already picking strawberries and i'm mindful of what um um was it uh, someone that said talk about their uh, uh was it stacy talking about picking peaches <coughs> and preserving peaches and then apple butters and things like that we've done that for some time uh uh shauna what's your thoughts on that let's see your hand raised right. Well, I wasn't even, oh, I was going to touch on that. You just opened up a whole nother door. <laughs> I, I was about to speak on the fact that, so it's really interesting. So I'm just going to say a couple of things. Um, being an African-American woman, I know we want to just say, okay, let's talk about African-American cuisine. But we all know that as African-American people, we come from mm -hmm. all different places, whether it's, and I mean, from the continent. Mm -hmm. So I am African American. I have my ancestors who are literally, I can, I know great great grandparents who were literally in the cotton fields. I have a grandmother who is Cuban, Jamaican. Mm -hmm. I have I have all kinds of things running through me. But what's really interesting is I have found such commonality in the regarding the types of foods. So the black eyed peas, you know, the rice and peas, the mm -hmm. collard greens. Mm -hmm. My husband, who's Nigerian, I've had his collard greens. I've had, you know the Caribbean, the African. So what I'm saying is, it's just, to me, this African-American food is such a united, it's such a, a way to unite us. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's a uniting us as people from the diaspora, from the Caribbean, from everywhere. And African-American people are from all of these places. As far as what you're talking about, as far as being more health focused, more forward, it's very interesting you say that because when I think about African-American food, I think about my grandmother getting down with the the swine and with all the the yummy butter and and yes we had collard greens but a lot of times we had the pork in there mm -hmm. and then my husband comes over here and he just tears up half of our yard and <laughs> there's a garden he he has a green child and watch it no, I know okay. I know that's why I'm saying it but <laughs> he, he, he taught me that you yeah, can grow angry. Yeah, you can grow your you food. You can grow your food, yeah. He, he brought okra into our lives, which I don't really do too much of. That's another story. But Ooh. peppers and all of all of these fresh tomatoes, all of that. And, you know, there are times where he'll make a vegetable stew. I, we don't even eat meat, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a part of his culture, which I've realized is my culture as an African-American. We've been eating African food in America and calling it African-American food. You know yeah, what I yes. mean? So that's just, um, I think that it's just like anything, everything evolves, everything grows, we appreciate, we be healthy. And I think that to your point, um, if we don't have to do things a certain way that jeopardizes our health, um, you know, mm -hmm. that's how we should do it. So I know I'll let him speak because I'm sure he has something to say. Um, <laughs> he's been in the chat. He's been in the chat throwing stuff. I know he's been tearing up the chat. I didn't um, want to show his face. <laughs> brother She's save y'all. What do you guys about to save y'all? She's <laughs> never gonna let the garden thing go, but you know, that's, that's <laughs> um first off, um, I'm really um grateful to be among them uh, and listening to everyone share different recipes and cultures. Um it's not just food to me, it's um, it's history. It's, mm. it's connected to our body, our souls, and our mind. So um, I'm really grateful to hear all of that. So yeah, I'm just gonna start that. And um, I'm Chana's husband, and that's my mother-in-law, Ariel. Um, the main reason I actually raised up my hands was because of when we were talking about the Fufu celebration. So, 
when I come across um, videos of Fufu on social media and all of this, there's, so in Nigeria, we don't call Fufu, anything that is like a mashed potato kind of wrap, we call it a swallow. The reason we call it a swallow is because it goes with soups or stew. So we have fufu, which is made from cassava in Nigeria specifically. And the term kind of bounces around when you go to different countries. In Ghana, fufu is a mixture of cassava and plantain. If you mm. go further out to probably like Liberia or Sierra Leone, it's more maybe plantain <coughs> and cocoyam. So it means different things in different places. So it, like one has to be kind of specific with it to be sure you're giving across. It's almost like how I'm trying to think of how a phrase or a term ends up being generalized, almost like, like ramen. And there are different mm. kinds of ramen, something like that. Mm -hmm. So like we usually just say swallow in Nigeria. And then we are like specify on what kind of swallow. And then we say fufu, which is cassava based. Then we have pounded yam. Which is basically yam, like um, the African, West African yam. But I think I've seen some of those yams growing in the Caribbean and Jamaica too. So um, we have that. We also have um, another thing we call amala. It's more of a Yoruba based kind of swallow. So what happens is that you take the yam peelings and then you dry them in the sun for a long time and mm. they get a little bit dark, then you blend them. And so the swallow is a little bit darker. It's not my favorite kind of swallow, but you know, that's. Um, up for discussion. And then we also have something called, it's upper northern, not Nigeria, um, not African. It's called Tuo Chikafa. It's basically rice that is cooked to a point where it is so soft, almost like a mashed kind of potato kind of level. And then you mash up the rice and then you eat it with vegetables and stuff like that. So yeah, I'm trying to think of other things. Well, yeah, those are majorly the kind of Delicious. things we have. Mm. So, babe, why don't you just tell them how your food, what foods in Nigeria make you think of African American? Oh, mm. almost everything, almost everything. Um, the the number one, the the number one thing that makes me like feel like this is home is um collard greens. Collard greens, they they just it just feels like something that is from home. Um, collard mm -hmm. greens. The way the chicken is made. Okay, so here's the interesting thing. <laughs> <laughs> get it, get it. <laughs> yeah. The way the chicken is made is really nice. But but this is an interesting thing. There's just one difference because it feels like the way we make it. There's just one difference. So, okay, maybe let me be specific. Let me talk about Nigeria because sometimes we do things crazy more than other people for no reason. We just like doing things unnecessarily. But you know that's how we roll. So if I were to get a fresh piece of chicken meat. I would first of all, you know, clean it and all of that. Then I would make it broth out of the chicken before frying it or baking it. But I realized most of the meat, it depends, not everywhere. Some places yeah, you just get the chicken, make sure it's clean, and then you throw it and start frying. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's the only difference. And I, I think also it's because we have a culture of trying to make a broth out of anything. Mm. Anything is like we, we don't waste an opportunity to make a broth, a fish, a meat, <laughs> a crayfish. You're like, we have so many broths, and most times we just keep them sealed, mm -hmm. keep them in the, in the freezer, and then you know, use it for a meal for another day. So we do yeah. the same thing, put it on top of the stove after we go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but, exactly. But, that, but, th but there is a concern, it might be because I'm 73 and I'm really at the point where. I'm generative and have a lot of opinionation. And here's my concern though, I'm beginning to sound like my great grandfather around being worried about the world. And here's my concern, do you think, and this goes back to your provocative question, Hayward, and you know, my daughter, and she's been this vegan thing periodically. So here's my question, the younger children whose parents are conscious Mm. Are raising them to eat different food, to eat more vegetable-based, vegan-based food. They really are. Mm -hmm. They're being, they're being, it's more available, it's more promoted. And unless they're poor kids, mm -hmm. well, even some of the poor kids are getting food pantries that give them vegetables and fresh food. They're eating it more than my generation did. Um, um, and so my concern is. That the younger, the Z, the Z, the Z, the Zoomzers or whatever they're, the Z kids, they're not going to know how to cook this stuff. Because, mm -hmm. because, because my, my children's generation, they're going to cook some of it, but right. they don't know how to cook 
it as a thorough cultural menu. Right. And uh, my concern is that, is it possible, Haywood, that we could lose our cultural comfort food yeah. perspective and, and we end up having only a few folk who make a lot of money? I'm, I'm going to talk about chitlins. I will spend $50 on a plate of chitlins that's clean and well-cooked and tender because mm. you can't find it. <laughs> And everybody does not how to do it. And I don't want to wash the chitlins <laughs> and cook them all day long. But what I'm saying to you is I will pay for them now mm -hmm. because they are hard to get mm -hmm. in a quality, in a way that you can trust, right? And so they yes, become right. gourmet. They become gourmet. And, and going back to the point that was made before, and Black folk ain't the only one that will eat them either now. That right, right. So right. do you think there's any risk of the younger generation losing the culture of you know that food that Cherie's talking about some of which I don't quite understand but now Sadie's helped me understand it's really the same food it's just framed a different way um do you think there's a risk of losing it do we have some young folk on the phone um that's under 30 under 25 under 20 I mean because it's the 20 year olds the 17 year olds if they don't know how to cook this stuff, it's not going to be cooked for their children. I think it goes back to what Brother Miles said when he was talking about the cast iron skillet. Um, I have one, and I have one because my grandmother had one, and because my mother had one, and okay. that's one of the things that I know how to cook from. Although, and Miss Sharon talked about it earlier also. So we have Kwanzaa still, we have New Year's Eve, we have New Year's Eve. And then we have the other festivals, like Fufu Festival, and then for people who are Muslim, there's Eid, and so on and so on. The traditions, everything lies in the tradition more mm -hmm. than it does in the food itself. Not just in the way it's prepared, but in who's preparing it. We call it soul food because it makes you feel good. It doesn't even necessarily have to be good or taste good, but it makes you feel good. Mm -hmm. So if we don't lose that part of it, the essence of it, the essence of being in the kitchen, the essence of understanding what community meant, the essence of what Brother Raymond was talking about earlier with having cars and packing them and understanding Green Book travel. I understand Green Book travel. I mean, we had to do that traveling down south with my great grandparents. You have to travel during the daytime. You're not stopping at certain gas stations. You have a chicken that's in wax paper. I remember eating my first egg sandwich was something my great granddaddy made. So those things I share with my children and share with them the reasons why we did certain things. It's the same thing why the uh, Jewish community continues Passover. It's understanding that struggle that one goes through and that if your, that blood wasn't on your door then your firstborn didn't make it out of Egypt that night. Right. It's the exact same thing, which leads into Easter and the resurrection of Christ and so right. on. And so, on. so if we understand what it's giving us, and there's an, a, a great Netflix documentary. I think it's a series, High on the Hog, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it really gets into what food does for people. So when we talk about struggle food or when we talk about soul food or when we talk about from the Caribbean or even if you go soul from South Korea, they make chicken, but they got their chicken from the GIs who were there doing uh, World War I, no, doing the Korean War, excuse me, who were stationed there who taught them how to fry chicken. So when you get that black and chicken that comes from, from Korea, that's our stuff coming back to us oh, from oh. Our, from my granddaddy, who was a Korean War soldier who was over there, who maybe even have a baby or two over there that we don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't even know he was over there because they didn't tell the American public we was in a war in Korea. Exactly. You know that, right? We, yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, ma'am. Nobody knew because it was a conflict. It wasn't an actual, it wasn't an actual war. It was considered a conflict. So right. when we when we look at what it gives us, so often more than not, and this is this is why I mentioned watermelon and some of the stigma behind what we do. The stigma behind us became, well, at least I'm not black. So whatever we was doing was wrong. No matter if it was making us feel good, no matter if it was helping us economically, no matter if it was teaching us and helping us move forward, moving out of even to be able to uh, uh, migrate, we had to be able to get in cars and get on trains and get on buses. Nobody took a plane. That wasn't the way. It was a great, it was a great migration because people coupled up together. A lot of ways that people come from the Caribbean into this country and or right. from other places in this country with family members and friends who have it. So if we lose sight of why we were doing what we were doing, then that's the, to me the greater danger 
than losing the food itself. Because traditionally, I, my wife could make spaghetti squash taste like spaghetti. And I will put that with fish and spaghetti because I eat fish and spaghetti. Now I have mm -hmm. conversations with my friends who are from California who may not understand what fish and spaghetti means to me, but that is a meal and a delicacy. And I'm going to have me some fried fish and some spaghetti on Friday night. Yes. Because again, I, <laughs> wow. grew up Muslim and I grew up around Black Jews and I grew up around Seventh day Adventists and I also grew right. up around Catholics and they didn't eat meat on Friday. So right. I'm growing up in these communities where people didn't even eat meat. And that's just, that's what we, right. the McDonald's that's sells the fish. Ate. Fried Catholics. fish and spaghetti. Mm -hmm. Exactly. McDonald's sells fish fillet for the Catholics who were in Ohio who they were trying to sell food to. So mm -hmm. whenever, and this is what I like about Black history now. Um, I have a lot of people to, who, who I talk to who are like, ah, it's been commercialized. What else did we want for it to become the commercial? Because we wanted to be able to see reflections of ourselves when we went to the grocery store right. and we were in society. So when I see red, black, and green hanging out from someplace, I'm like, that's us. We did that and we ensured there it is. I see you, Miss Betsy. When we see that, that's us. And that's us ensuring that we have a place in society. And in doing so, now we have to ensure that our children don't forget how we got that place and how we got to that place. And I'll end there because Miss Fatma, Fat Mod, I hope I'm saying that right, um, has had her hair raised for a little while. But that's the thing. As long as we don't lose sight of how we got to this place, something like Wynton Marcella said, truthfully, we're only moving forward into our past because today is really going to be behind us tomorrow. So if we're mindful of where we're going, then we got to be mindful of who we're taking along with us and why you got why we eat this way. Why you got to stop and take this meal? Why you got to stop and understand what Passover is? Why you got to stop and understand what eat, these different traditions that we have in our communities and our cultures because we have been creating it as we go along and what we took with us we had to hide from the master. This is why we don't know that it was the same. Whatever black, whatever we had with us that we were able to take, we had to hide from them that they, we knew what we were doing so that they didn't know what we were doing. That's really what it boils down to. And well, I, I just want a little <laughs> excerpt because that was wonderful, Hayward. But, but really? can I shout out yeah. to, um, to Sharon? Anybody know where I can get some good chitlins like you? <laughs> <laughs> you <also> not. <laughs> I just passed all my major, major medical tests. I'm good. You need to go down Southern Maryland, maybe Charles County or Calvert County. And okay. then, then there's some store, stores on the side of the road. Mm. They still sell them a lot. In the butter. Okay. okay. In the butter. Mm. In the bucket. In the bucket. bucket. Thank you, Stacy. Wow. You helped me remember what I should have already known because I know where that is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We go down there. Thank you, Stacy. No problem. And Fadmata has been has her ha had her hand raised. She wanted to make a comment. Um, not much really, but um I'm so upset because I was so I was caught up in so many other things I missed the beginning, but the bit that I've heard has just really lifted my heart. Um, and um, I grew up in South Florida, but I am from, I was born in Sierra Leone. So my Naja brother, <laughs> Al Fufu, my cassava. <laughs> Al Fufu with cassava. <laughs> um, so you know but you know they're different things um we have um uh eba um we have ebe that that's made out of the um same cassava but it's grated mm -hmm. and dried and then it's um again cooked sort of in water hot water and made into to almost look like the fufu, but it's more grainy um, and not as, you know, you don't swallow that one, right? Because it's <laughs> you, but you still would eat it with almost the same kind of sauce. So for me, my favorite is e eating it with okra, the what we call white okra. It's, and the only reason we call it white because we don't use any oil. We use all kinds of different meats and fish and chicken and you know and it's and it's usually very very spicy um, when you eat it with it. Um, it's hard for me to eat fufu if the sauce is not hot and spicy. Um, if I make it goosey, it's gonna be hot. It's gonna be spicy. 
And then we love eating it with what we call pepper soup. So you take you take the fufu and you make a hole in it with your with your with your thumb and you scoop and that's what you take to swallow it with. Um, you know, fufu is something that a lot of times it used to be maybe on a Sunday, you know, special kind of thing on a weekend for us in Sierra Leone. I know you're not Japanese. <laughs> Don't stop, stop, stop shaking your head. Hey, stop shaking your head. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is regular by the way <laughs> um so anyway so a lot of times um for for people um it's sort of special um on a weekend if you know because it's um it's and and they have it at um functions and they'll make like those little balls of it and that's how you you eat it with fufu um, but, you know, I heard somebody, um, I think uh, Ms. Cheryl talk, um, stated the thing about Jollof. Don't get that started anywhere because then <laughs> you will forever not be done with that conversation. Mind <laughs> you, Jollof itself comes, from, Senegalese, Senegalese. comes from Wolof. <laughs> Wolof, Senegalese. Right? But yet, yeah, Senegal, but, yeah. but yet, who's arguing over it? Niger people. I never argue about this. Okay, let's. I never argue about this. It belongs to the Senegalese. They have the best today. No, that, that's what it's like. I'm, it's it's I'm always the most, it's it's the most, is good. It's I'm the most interesting debate to me. The word itself, Jollof, comes from the Wolof people, and here all yeah. these other people arguing that is <laughs> that is theirs. It's just the most interesting. But, <laughs> but the point I was making for Fatma is just how food, in the way we symbolize it. Yeah. Has deep personal meanings for different subcultures within the diaspora. Yes. And, and what we've heard is that the diaspora means that the African American food is connected to African food. That we are. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm hearing a lot. In, I'm hearing that in the group. I think there's a lot of folk have reinforced that. And that mm -hmm. the, West, the, the West Virginia food is also the Bostonian up south version of the food. <laughs> Or the Washingtonian never went south version of the food. Then we are yep. we are we are connected by this food thing, but we have such diverse symbolic meanings that we assign. But it all comes back to our possessive understanding of that the food comforts us because our struggle across the diaspora has been hard and continues yep. to be hard. Yes, because racism definitely. racism is global. And yes. I want to and add something because <laughs> we have we we we've, we've gone full circle, which is so beautiful. Because uh, another thing that we need to recognize is that Africa has been a part of African America through the food, through the behavior, through the language. I mean, we haven't lost that connection. My dad mm -hmm. uh, would talk about Africa. When we were, when he was fixing his wonderful scrambled eggs, and I heard about we were from Africa when I was very young. So I didn't have my first Black Studies class uh, and learn who I was because <laughs> there, there was, and there were African Americans who mm -hmm. were part of the UNIA who were, right. and I'm sure, and you know, I, he never mentioned it, but I'm sure he was a Garveyite. Right. And I mean, that's so the notion of our being connected to Africa is nothing new. And it mm -hmm. shows in our food. It shows in the way we dress. Mm -hmm. It shows in all this. And so, you know, I just want to put that up. I'll staple my lips again. Yeah, you know, and it shows in Michael Jackson's Afro beats. It shows in, in the way we dance. Yeah. Uh, co co yeah. Courageous championship and athleticism. You know, you know he got green from across the water. These these people who have this remarkable talent because their generations of ancestors survived the death, mm -hmm. the death. And you know, and we have so many incredible athletes. So yeah, we are connected. And you know what? Ali connected, Michael Jackson connected. There's so many who have connected to Africa with an international um, visibility. That are African American, so to speak. We're yeah, we're connected. Right. Not well, just the little people, but all of us, the celebrities too. 
Mm. Well, even the chefs, like, I just really love that we have a lot of chefs who are bringing their culture, you know, a lot of chefs who are African chefs or African American chefs who have, you know, very specific African lineage that they're bringing over and, and exposing yeah. us to, um, you know, being in a catering industry, it's just awesome to see that and them, yeah. you know, uplifting their heritage and making it easier for us as African American people learn about, you know, the food that, you know, of where they come from. So, and then people want to know where they come from and they want to eat the food that they would have eaten if they were there. So I think it's just a beautiful thing, just being united together like that. So. That was a great article in uh, New York Times um, earlier this week, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. about uh, uh, African-American chefs in New Orleans. And oh, actually nice. it focuses on an, uh, a, mm. a young man from Africa, but then he, because, you know, the New York Times was shining a light on all these, you know, on New Orleans, he had a bunch of people that he wanted to help support that in, he included in the article. Um, mm. I wish I could tell you the date. I could probably find it. Okay, out. I'll find it. But, but my daughter happens to be one of them. So, oh, <laughs> oh, Jeff in, um, in New Orleans. Yeah. Jeff in New Orleans. Oh. Oh, yeah. that's, that's and I love New Orleans, by the way. Such what, what's, oh, yeah. what's wild to me is you cannot talk about soul food without talking about New Orleans. Oh, oh, that's that's great. Talk about it. and and part of the, the French and their the way that because of them and their how influence. and because right. of their influence, but also because of how other slave owners didn't do what they did as far as giving Sundays off. You know, they mm -hmm. were heavy into that giving Sundays off. So when you're giving that Sundays off, they allow for jazz to be created. They Absolutely. also allow for cuisine to be created, but also they allow for escape to happen at the same time because a lot of folks <laughs> are escaping into those, into those, uh, uh, in that, that native country down there, right? Into those yeah. Seminole yeah. lands and going yes. down into Florida and whatnot. So when you look at the mix of what came out of there with that French cuisine, but also with that, that uh, Native Creole. American aspect, that Creole yeah. vibe and the African vibe, just yep. the food literally is this plethora of what the world is. Culture. Mm -hmm. you know, it's mm -hmm. just this cultural hodgepodge of like, of whoa, down. okay, I see why y'all was, I see. I see why they said let them eat cake because y'all was eating good. <laughs> <laughs> I gave like 10 pounds on one weekend. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't go to all this and not gain no weight. I'm sorry. No, just don't like wow. Even yeah. down there, they still have the, and, I, and I'm a fan of it. I, I talk about eating healthy, but I say what I say. I like Popeye's chicken. Down there. <laughs> oh, I, no. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And they have that mm -hmm. the last buffet in Louisiana because that's where Louisiana is Popeye's chicken, you know? Uh, and that's the, okay. that's the one chicken that I will, aside from my mama's and my wife's, that's really it for me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It's, I'm not a church's dude, you know, Bojangles, <laughs> the, the name Bojangles, although the biscuits are good, just Bojangles, I feel Father. like it should, be, it should be a dancing crow in the box. But. <laughs> in, Ghana, in Ghana, they have, pop, you talk about Popeyes, they have yes, a franchise called Papaye. Papaye. Exactly <laughs> like Papaye. I'm familiar, Papaye. Yay, yay. Papaye. <laughs> we got a yay, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that's what's, what's wild to me. It's like, and yeah. and that was a part of how we, how, how the slave trade worked was to seclude us from us and have us thinking that we were the only ones. Right. You know, mm -hmm. because when we keep talking about the diaspora, what we find out is that there are so many people who have been ostracized and marginalized, but also have to find ways of comfort. And food is that first way of comfort. Like, I don't know if you guys ever had Peruvian chicken. I mean, uh, I don't know oh, what kind of slavery they had in Peru. But <laughs> <laughs> My beans came <laughs> from Peru. <laughs> yeah. Those spices are Woo! like phenomenal. When they talk about this in the rub, I'm like, what's in that rub? Cocaine? I mean, what's <laughs> 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 you know, it? No, it's good. Peruvian chicken you have like is a, the bomb. Like a, it's Delicious. Just, that's, it's so it's good. The bomb. When you get it's so good. When you Brazilian. We go down even further down, you know, you like we get some of that Brazilian food that comes out. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, when we look at all of our people who were there, I'm like, right. they just didn't stop doing what they were doing back home. Like we were forced to up here in the States. Mm -hmm. right. They were able to keep on with their traditions and cultures, but that yeah, part right. of Brazil is not shown to us. Yeah, it's parts of Peru and Ecuador are not shown to us. Yeah. And it's like, we're everywhere. We're wow. in Poland, you know, <laughs> we're everywhere. 
with our food. Right. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> we need to, we need to all do a world tour. And just, you know? You no, know, taste on everything. We're going to go to Popeye's. We're going to go to Popeye's. Yay. Sheree <laughs> <laughs> wants Peru. to jump in. Yeah, can I? I, I want to just say this to you. The the question was posed earlier whether whether um, these traditions would continue, right? You know, right. because of all the 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 movement toward healthy eating and whatnot. And you know, I I think the answer is a resounding yes. And here's how I know because my great grandmother fried her chicken in lard. I, I don't fry my chicken in lard, but I'm right. still frying chicken. I mean, you know, this is, um, you know, there, there is, there, there is adjustment. There is, you know, and and that is the beauty of the culture, that mm -hmm. no matter, That's no true. matter what, we figure out how to adapt to live, mm -hmm. right? And 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 so, you know, I know, I know, I cannot wrestle my son down and put a black eyed pea in his mouth but <laughs> but i know that at some point it you know but he he will eat barbecue and he will eat greens okay so 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 i know the culture and the traditions live on you know gotta you know just like you know on on my little uh new year's plate you know i had um I included stewed tomatoes. That wasn't a part of what we did for New Year's Eve, but but you know I included it because I I cannot eat beans without without stewed tomatoes. You know, uh, cooking adapts to where you are, you are, how you are, and to to what you find yourself in. So so I I have absolutely no no doubt that you know that that the folks who come after us will figure out a way to to take these traditions and 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 to to keep what's good and 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 to get rid of you know some of the unhealthy things you know that 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 we that we may have been raised with because mm. you know i i think that's a good note to transition on because we only have 15 minutes left and I was thinking about you, Sheree, when you said, and I said, I guess I'll break down and get an air fryer microwave so I can fry chicken <laughs> with an air fryer. Right, right. That would taste the same, but right. it would be a new version. But you know what? I think we do adapt. And so I appreciate you sharing that with us. Here's what I'd like for us to do. <clears throat> There's 36 folks signed up on here. Mm. And I'd like for us to do a ritual to close this out. It's going to take us to 15 minutes, right? And if everyone could just share in one or two sentences, and then we will be able to close out one or two sentences, what you're taking away from this very rich conversation, which I hate to see in, but we're going to have to end it in 15 minutes, correct? Um, Lisa, it'll be a two hour conversation, which is amazing uh, for Zoom, and that we're still talking. And what can we can you... go on. Yeah, oh, can... yeah, yeah. It's, we're we're <laughs> slotted for two hours. But, could we could we just have so we can be participatory people like Betsy has been in this uh, in the uh, chat. Uh, Teresa's got quiet when her sister came on. So can we do this? Can we just have two sentences, two sentences that capture where you are as you in this conversation? And that could be anything you want to say, anything. But can we do that and just go through and everyone chip in on that as we move through the end? Can we do that? Great, and I've removed all the spotlights so you'll light up when you talk. So go ahead and follow Cheryl's suggestion. Just I'll jump go. in. I'll talk. Okay. What I got from this wonderful discussion, I first want to say how, how grateful I am to all of you for reminding me how precious and and beautiful our culture is and how we express it so wonderfully through our food. My mouth is watering. That's how <laughs> delicious every single dish sounded. And I can't wait to have fufu. I am so happy to be amongst this, this wonderful group of people to talk more and more about growing up and remembering all of the wonderful um, food that I grew up with. Thank you, thank you so much.
I would like to thank everyone for sharing your many wonderful food recipes and experiences. I just want to encourage everyone to try out Akuna Matata in Silver Spring and taste some really good East African dishes. Mm. Thank you. We got that. You're coming. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for bringing back. I remembered as you were speaking, I remembered some foods and traditions that I had forgotten about. So thank you for reminding me. I'm going to try to uh, look into Balducci's here that I understand had the smoked shoulder. I don't know that I'd know how to cook it, but if I find it, uh, I'll find somebody who knows how to cook it. Okay. One thread that's um common through all the conversation is how uh, intertwined food and family is. And you can't talk about the food without talking about family and loved ones. And that love stretches all the way back generations. That's an absolutely beautiful thing to think about. Mm, yes, yes. Uh, for me, I am thankful uh, that I'm first of all I'm thankful for this, but I'm also thankful for knowledge of the past, the gift of the present, and I am stoked about what is happening tomorrow because um, all of this is going with us. And I'm gonna see you out there, Hakuna Matatas, because I have no words. <laughs> I'll be I'll be there too, Betsy. I'm coming. Let's go. Let's get together, family. <laughs> that was great. Let Help me in. Is there any peach cobbler left? <laughs> That's the question, brother Bob. That's the real question. Right, right, right. <laughs> I know. Uh, Sharon I'll, got it. She I'll got it. Sharon got it. That, that um, this has been so wonderful, and I I think also as I'm listening is that how the food, the family, but also the spirit, the spirit that keeps going wherever we are. Uh, the spirit really brings us together. And I'm so glad that uh, uh, Teresa was talking about the memories. Never, never forget the memories and trigger the memories in others because we can never forget where we've come from and where we're going. Mm -hmm. That's how we started this conversation. Think about the memories as you think about the food that come together. Thank you, Sharon. Mm -hmm. I, I just like to say, I hope my system doesn't freeze because it's been going back and forth freezing, but I, I was so much enjoying the conversation because every day I think to myself, you know, I was born in the right time of life because I've seen the past and, um, I'm here for the present. I'm not sure what the future will be. None of us are. But hopefully um, what my parents and grandparents brought me through, I keep trying to share with this next generation in some way that um, is not money that makes your life. It's really family, caring about one another, creating memories and being a part of a world that has become estranged in a way, but we must keep hope alive. And um, what has been said here tonight about the food is more than the food. It, it's, a, it's part of a, of, a, of a country that this land was built on. I mean, we made it come alive, not only with the food, that we have and the music that we have, but what was behind all of that. And so I'm very thankful for the opportunity to just listen and thank you. Um, I just wanna say that I thought this was gonna just be about some macaroni and cheese and collard greens and you know, it was gonna be a good time, but I have to say this has been a great experience of community. Um, I think, especially as African-Americans, we go into this world and sometimes we feel alone because the, the struggle's real, 
but I feel like I've made some great friends here. And I also feel like um, I was able to remember my grandma a little bit today, which was a beautiful, a beautiful reason. So um, this has been such a feel good. You all are such lovely people. And I really appreciate this time. And again, this was just a beautiful community. Well, I'd like to thank um, whoever it was that emailed me and reminded me to get on this. And I'm sorry that I arrived late. And I, you know, enjoyed this. It took me, it took me back to my grandmother, who when I was growing up, you know, as a teenager, she was the person that I feel like understood me and I understood her better than anyone else on the planet. And she, for me, personified my my definition of what hospitality is and so it took me back and it also took me forward mm -hmm. to my daughter who as i said is a, is a chef and you know cook a, a, a chef is what she is a cook is what she is i mean it's it's just her i mean and and going moving to new orleans was like the, the rabbit being thrown in the briar patch and she hit she hit New Orleans and she caught fire. And yeah. so now she's working and she she was like, I guess the youngest um, uh, head chef at at uh, a pretty, I guess, fancy restaurant called um, shoot, Sylvain's. And and finally she got tired of that and 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 felt like she wasn't putting enough good in the world. And now she's working at a place called uh, Cafe Reconcile, and you know, it take me too long to explain what it does, but it really does, you know, pass our traditions on to young people, and also gives them an opportunity to to move forward in life. She got tired of, you know, working with, you know, fifty year old dishwashers that had no uh, chance of moving forward into in, in the industry. So now she's making that happen for for young people. So. For her. That's it for me. Wonderful. Thank you. It's Martha Wiggins, if anybody wants to know. Very beautiful. Thank you, Sharon. Anyone else? Do we have everyone? Um, I think I'm just gonna um so I'm just gonna leave with this one quote um by Kwame Nkrumah. He was the first president of Ghana. Um, it says, um, the forces that unite us are intrinsic and greater than the superimposed influences that keep us apart. And um, that's what this has shown me. In this. So I'm grateful to have been here. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, I, I, I want to leave with a this, quote too. So let me just, because here's, you know, Malcolm X said, um, just because a cat has kittens in the oven, that don't make them biscuits. <laughs> Amen. Did they, did they say that? And, and to me, that that Sorry. that is exactly Sorry. what this conversation. Sorry. If a cat Sorry. has Sorry. Uh, if a cat has kittens in the oven, that don't make them biscuits, right? <laughs> and, and, and that is that is exactly what this conversation has been about. You know that we. We 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 were um, kittens born in this oven, you know. Mm, um, mm, mm. But but you know we and and we are not biscuits. We are still connected kittens. So oh, um, so yeah, uh, you know that that seemed to me to be a very food related and culturally related. <laughs> that is one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Anyone else? What's your closing thought as you say goodnight? What's what's on your mind? Miss Juanita, did you have something? Yeah, I was gonna say, um, um my 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 comment is what's the follow-up date to tonight? We all need to think of a new yeah, we need to think of an, uh, another date because this this conversation can go on, and I don't think one night is gonna. And one night's not. We need more than one night. 
I think I heard Brother Savior say we could come to his place because he got a garden. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, so you, you, I was going to hang out. We were going to cook something for him. I think that's what I heard. I think that's what I had heard. He'll cook for all of us. Just tell him to cook that tomato stew. That's my favorite that he makes. Oh, oh my goodness. I think that's what I had heard. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I, I cook feijoada and I do it oh. pretty. Mm. And I hope that you all like black bean. Yeah. yeah, love it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Marie, I mean, Marie, Marie has her hand up, Marie Hamilton. Oh, well, I just, I guess I'm an interloper here because I'm one who, cook, who fixes food in the kitchen. But um, <laughs> I, I just have been brought to tears thinking, you know, someone once told me a long time ago, the job of a parent is to give their children memories. Mm. And in the end, that's what you have yeah. that kind of makes, makes you who you are. You know, they'll say the person with dementia doesn't remember and just is not, you know, doesn't know who they are because it's the memories that make you that. And so I just want to commend all of you for the lesson. Take your lesson far and wide. And um, as a little white girl who <laughs> had a great mom who could cook out of anything, I guess what I learned that she passed down was how to, out of whatever was in the refrigerator leftover, we would, she would call, you know, and say, we'd say, mom, what are we having for dinner? And she was helping my dad at his work. And she'd say, well, what's in the refrigerator? And there's nothing. And she would come home and out of that nothing produce a meal oh. for nine of us that had leftovers oh. and the next day out of those leftovers. And so that is, if we can't teach our kids, maybe some of our recipes, I never wasted anything and they've learned that lesson. And just, you know, a lot of times out of nothing, what you can make, if you just sort of the magic is in the love and the desire. And I've learned so much from all of you. So it's just a gift I'm going to pass on to a lot of people, a lot of friends in my family. And I'm going to try to be a better cook. <laughs> <laughs> you in the you. kitchen. Oh, you ain't got to try. You already doing it. You already <laughs> doing it. Thank you just you, cooked Maureen. up a good one right there. You just cooked up some good emotions right there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Did we, get, did we get the goodbye from Mr. Fudge or did he leave us already? He no, he's, no he's, still still, he, he's still here, yeah. Okay, yeah. what you going to say, Mr. Fudge? Okay, this has been a wonderful evening. I've gleaned so many tidbits from all y'all, some great memories. Uh, as one whose uh, great-grandparents actually grew up at the t on the tail end of slavery, I had that long tradition, the same food which is nourished just down through the generations is still with us today. And that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right Amen. Amen. Do, do we Amen. give every opportunity, Lisa? You're going to close us with the last comment? Yes. Did Lisa, Wanda you... get a chance to? I to started say... us off. Yeah, she you started, were the one who started, I started us off. off. And Wanda's yeah. good. She jumped right in there. She's and was there right anyone there. else who Perfect. wanted a? I'll um I'll, I'll say my little one liner. Uh oh, what about Savior? He spoke. He spoke. He spoke. He okay, he yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. He invited us all over. And Miles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Miles spoke. I just want to make sure everyone gets a chance. He invited us all over. <laughs> Was there anyone else who wanted we're to gonna, make a we're comment? Gonna, we're gonna go to the restaurant. Right. Oh, we are, we are, we're going to plan something. And um, so I want to thank everyone for helping to make this a success. It, these, these discussions are just so heartwarming and, um, and instructive as well as um, a way for us to connect and to remind ourselves we're, we're very connected still to the past as well as our future. You know, the future generations will look back on us believe it or not <laughs> and and we're also we're also connected um you know across cultures too so you know this just reminds me that we we have we share so much in common in our in our traditions and our 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 worldview and love of each other and family and just wanting the best for ourselves and our families and um yeah, so it's you you brought, you know, these discussions always bring to mind my own grandparents who were uh, children of Italian immigrants and didn't waste food and hunted and picked much of what they ate. And um, so I try to always learn from them in this modern world. Um, anyway, thank you so much to 
to Cheryl and to Chana for hosting yeah, this another wonderful culinary wonderful traditions culinary discussion. Culinary. Our next one will be uh, definitely in June with the Caribbean diaspora. That's, that's going to be one you won't want to miss, probably in late June, because we've got all of our blues festival events. We've got Silver Spring Blues Way kicking off. We are actually doing an outing to Wolf Trap to see um, uh, June 11th. It's, um, I'm blanking. Who's playing there? Are my blues people who, who's playing it? Um, he's like the oldest blues man alive. Who is playing at Wolf's? I'm blinking right now. Um, you email us. Yeah, yeah. So, buddy guy, you know, buddy guy, buddy guy, buddy guy. Yeah, I was buddy thinking guy. also of the next week as someone else. Um, oh, yeah, man. yeah. So we're doing an outing to Wolf Trap on Sunday, June 11th. That kicks off our Blues Week. We have all kinds of events scheduled. We're soon announcing, and we've got a wonderful Blues Festival planned. The 14th annual Silver Spring Blues Ow. Festival. And we will do an outing to Hakuna Matata with everybody here, hopefully. So let's let's plan on that. Betsy can Betsy can help organize that with me. Well, Betsy is originally from um, Tanzania, so Uganda. Uganda. I'm sorry, she's East African. Yeah, yeah. So Betsy, Betsy's from Uganda, right? Right. Um, Anyway, thank you again to Cherie Branson, Wanda Whiteside, Ray Fudge, Sharon Lee Minor, who's on our Women in the Arts panel, which is in late, it's postponed to late March. This event, by the way, was postponed. It was originally scheduled in early March, but there was a big uh, county meeting that had to be planned. Uh, and so we pushed it back to the state. Uh, thank you also to the, the two bluesmen who were on our panel, Miles Spicer and Phil Wiggins. Thank you yeah, so much. Great. Great. Uh, Thanks for great having them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Paul McHaywood Turnipseed, Teresa Saxton, Wanda Whiteside, who's on our board of director or was on our board of directors, is in, in our on our advisory board. Uh, and runs Live Gara Theater, which is the African American theater company in Silver Spring. She just had an event this past weekend. So, yes, all so of them. thank you. Thank you. And so, I would like to thank my son in law for joining me and helping me with the facilitation. And, and Haywood, thank you too, because you were quite brilliant at keeping it going. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you to everyone. It was it was a wonderful event, and I will share the video with with everybody again. So we will see you soon. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.